Thank you. Uh, thank you, Scott, for running the session. Um, so uh, like most people here, I, I wrote the abstract for this thing in January um, without necessarily knowing what I was going to talk about. Um, and so over the past several months, I was sort of planning to just whine about seismological data formats for 20 minutes. Um, but then I decided that probably that's what I wanted to talk about and not what people really wanted to hear. Um, so instead, I wanted to sort of tell the story of an earthquake as it flows through uh, the data systems at NEIC. Um, is it uh, so I decided to tell the story of an earthquake as it sort of flows through our, our data systems um, and, then, and then do a, hopefully a short demo, if I have time, um, on how to retrieve data from our website. Uh, and then <laughs> last Thursday, uh, we had uh, a big earthquake in the Southern California area. And then on Friday, an even bigger earthquake in the Southern California area. So I figured I should probably take the time to talk about that. Um, so quick show of hands, how many people actually felt either of those earthquakes? Anyone? OK. You don't have a ride home. Um, so yeah, so I'll talk about uh, where I come from. So I'm a developer, um, actually from an oceanographic background, but then uh, sort of wound up doing scientific development. Um, so I develop applications uh, regarding earthquake impact, so, so human impacts of earthquakes, so not so much the, you know, the physics of how do we detect earthquakes and, and how are they located, um, but so ground shaking and then fatalities and economic losses. Um, and then I also work with scientists to develop algorithms, uh, data sets, and applications. Um, so the applications and the libraries that I've worked on are, are ShakeMap, which is a, a system that develops, um, that uses earthquake location um, and other information to make a map of ground shaking. Uh, and then Pager, which is a prompt app, uh, I'll have the acronym later, um, which uh, informs people about the, the losses, the fatalities and economic, economic losses from earthquakes. Um, and then the library, so libcomcat, which I'll, I'll hopefully demo later, and then GM process, which is uh, dealing with the, the seismological data formats that I was going to whine about, but decided not to. Um, okay, so, uh, does this work? So this is, in, in North America, this is generally speaking where the earthquake hazards are. This is where my office is. Um, this is not an accident. Um, and it turned out to be a really good thing for, say, last week um, when you had two big earthquakes in Southern California. Okay, so just a, a sort of general overview of Python use at NEIC. Um, it's used for PAGER, which stands for Prompt Assessment of Global Earthquakes for Response, uh, the ShakeMap system, Ground Motion Processing Library, and LibComCat. Uh, and those are the projects that I work on. Um, it's also used for a system called ShakeCast, which is, so basically if you're, say, um, Caltrans, right? So this is the California Department of Transportation, and you have um, a large inventory of uh, structures and dams and aqueducts and things. Um, ShakeCast is a system that can take the maps of ground shaking that we produce and pinpoint, okay, so this, this aqueduct experienced uh, an acceleration of, you know, five or something, and so that's above its design threshold, so I should go check that out and inspect it. Um, so that's one application. Another application is Did You Feel It, which um, is, is a very sort of public-facing uh, web application where people can um, enter inf information about uh, what they ex experienced during an earthquake. So you answer questions like, you know, were the, were the windows um, rattling? Were, you know, did things fall off the shelf? Do you see cracks in the ground? Did you fall over? Um, those kinds of things. We take those responses, um, aggregate them and anonymize them, and then uh, do math with them, statistics, and then turn those into shaking intensity values. Um, and then we just have a lot of so the other like non-production uh, research projects that are, that are using Python more and more. I started at, at the NEIC in 2007, and I was the only person using Python. And now <clears throat> I think most of our, our new uh, postdocs and a lot of our students that come in are using Python. So it's great. I have some company. Um, so this is just sort of the big picture of data flow um, of an earthquake through the, the systems. And I'm going to go into details on, on some of these things as I go. But it, it sort of all starts with these seismic waveforms. Um, and so this is kind of a curious little creature that, that uh, we can use for all kinds of things. So it's used for 
locating earthquakes is used for determining the size of earthquakes. It can also be used for um, determining the structure of the Earth between the earthquake and the sensor that collects this data. We also use it to help determine um, how ground shaking falls off with distance for shake map, and I'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, so it's a pretty amazing uh, use of one pretty simple sensor. Um, so anyway, so it all sort of starts with these seismic waveforms, which are used to sort of feed uh, earthquake locations, and that's, that's a semi-automated process. We have analysts who work 24 seven um, and, and locate and determine the size of, of earthquakes all around the world. Um, so those earthquake locations feed into shake map along with um, some of these seismic waveforms and also the results of this Did You Feel It system. Um, and then we, have, we create maps of ground shaking. Um, those maps of ground shaking then feed into the pager system, uh, which comes up with estimates of fatalities and econo economic loss and also just exposure, population exposure to shaking. Uh, and I'll describe that in a little bit more detail later. And then all of these things wind up being piled into a system that we call COMCAT, which stands for Comprehensive Catalog. Um, so most, uh, most earthquake catalogs are basically just sort of a table of ID, time, latitude, longitude, and magnitude. Um, so we have that for our own locations of earthquakes, but also other organizations' locations of earthquakes, plus all of these sort of derived information products. And we pile it all into this big database and then uh, and then display it through the website and then through uh, an API. Um, and then there's a Python wrapper that I wrote around that API, and I'll get to that later. So starting off with just a seismic waveform. So um, seismometers me measure, generally speaking, either velocity or acceleration with time. Um, so these can be either you know, weak motion sensors or strong motion sensors. Um, Weak motion sensors, generally speaking, are not useful near an earthquake because, so my analogy is a uh, kitchen scale versus a truck scale, right? So you would not want um, to put a really, so like if I stood on the kitchen scale, it's just gonna peg, right? Um, and so that's basically the sort of, the weak motion sensors, you want those sort of far away from the earthquakes to detect really sensitive motions. The strong motion uh, sensors are the truck scale and so they're pretty insensitive to small motions but when big amplitude uh, waves hit them near the, the earthquake, they'll pick those up and, and record them accurately. Um, and so then you sort of into their, roughly speaking, two kinds of waves. Uh, P waves, which are sort of compressional waves, um, and then uh, S waves, which are, are whatever that other kind of wave is. Um, and so, and they come in at different times and you can use this uh, for all sorts of different, different things like locating earthquakes. So, um, you can basically take the, the difference in arrival time between a P wave and an S wave, and if you know the, the velocities of P and S waves, then you can use that to figure out the distance from any given station to the earthquake. And so since you know where the station is, now you can draw a circle around that station. And if you have at least two other stations, you can do the same thing, draw three circles, and where they intersect is the location of the earthquake. And so this was done by hand for a lot of years. Um, and I mean, there are more complicated algorithms now, uh, now, but for the most part, this is generally speaking uh, a good sort of pictorial representation. So incidentally, this is the first time I'd ever done this and I was sort of shocked that it actually just worked right out of the box. Um, so then the next thing that we wanna do for shake map is, uh, is collect the, the, the peak ground motions, right? So um, basically what we're looking at is so, uh, in the first couple of seconds since the origin, right? So we're, we're pretty soon after the origin. So we'll grab uh, a waveform like this and then grab the peak uh, value, either negative or positive, um, from each of the different channels. And normally there are three channels, so there's, a, generally speaking, a north-south channel, an east-west channel, and then, a, and then an up-down channel. Um, so we'll grab the peaks from each of those and then you know, sort of plot this on, on this uh, plot of distance versus uh, peak acceleration. So then we step through time and we collect more data and we grab all these peaks and so we sort of keep doing this and we sort of build up this, this plot over time of how the, the acceleration sort of fall off with distance. Um, so if you have a lot of these uh, waveforms from a bunch of different earthquakes, um, 
you can put them all together and use them to establish relationships um, that are hopefully predictive um, between distance and ground motions or velocity and acceleration, you know, whatever those might be, velocity, acceleration. Um, so a lot of more variables are, are used to do this. And so you would look at, you would group them by magnitude. Um, you would look at things like side effects. So what's the, the density of the material at the station where you're collecting this stuff? But in a very hand wavy way, uh, generally speaking, you can, um, you know, take the data that's like the one, the stuff that I just showed um, and sort of fit a curve to it. And then that's, that's your model. Um, it, like I said, it's a lot more complicated than that. And you have different models for different regions and different uh, kinds of tectonic regimes. So whether you're in a subduction zone, like in, in Cascadia or off of Japan or off of Chile, um, or if you're just in an active tectonic region like California. Um, so did you feel it, uh, like I was saying before, is this sort of citizen science um, project where the user survey results are sort of aggregated and then quantified into uh, what's called modified Mercalli intensity, which is a, a human intensity scale. So uh, it, it, there are statistical correlations with, with things like acceleration and velocity, but it is meant for, you know, uh, I don't know, think I have the scale here, but um, so one is effectively not felt. Um, seven is uh, very severe shaking, or eight is very severe shaking, and 10 is essentially everything is falling down. It's a total disaster, um, and it sort of scales in between there. Um, so the, one of the, the recent uh, Cyril's Valley earthquakes from last week uh, received something like 39,000 responses in the first hour following the earthquake. Um, and so by the way, it turns out, if you have an earthquake that's 120 miles from one of the most densely populated cities in the country, um, who all have access to the internet in their pockets, bad things can happen to your website. Um, <laughs> so. Uh, if anybody was looking at the website last, say, Thursday or Friday over the weekend and experienced some slowdowns, that, that's part of the reason why. Um, so the data flow for ShakeMap basically is take uh, these ground motion prediction models, which are, are created you know, as a, a scientific research project, right? and there are a whole bunch of these. Um, so take those, so data from these seismic waveforms um, in real time, or near real time, and, and grab the peaks, uh, and then the earthquake location um, mix in did you feel it data, and then uh, you come up with a, ma a map of ground shaking. And so we, we make maps of acceleration and velocity, um, as well as that the uh, modified Mercalli intensity, the MMI scale. Um, and we produce uh, maps that cover uh, the area surrounding the earthquake. Okay, so then, um, so shake map feeds into pager. Um, and so pager is basically based on uh, loss models that were created by looking at a uh, past history of, of population exposure to shaking. So how many people felt uh, in a given earthquake, you know, MMI-5? How many people felt MMI-6? Um, these models are derived for each country or groups of countries where we don't have enough data. Um, and so basically you have a loss rate uh, at a given MMI and then you have um, a population data set that we get that's gridded for the whole world. Um, and so effectively, it's a pretty simple calculation. I mean, so it's, this is super simple math. So basically take the, the population that you find in a given cell, find out the intensity in that cell, multiply those two together, um, and then you wind up just summing the products of all those over all of them, and you come up with a total number for fatalities. Uh, economic loss is similar. Um, except there's some other uh, factors in there thrown in for GDP and, and things like that. So then the pager data flow is basically to take um, the shake map, uh, this land scan population. So this is this uh, gridded population data set that I was talking about. Um, and then these loss rates convolve them with a lot of hand waving um, all together. And then we come up with this uh, information product. And so and I'll make a little pitch for this because I was the primary developer behind this, but I think the, the goal here is that is to sort of summarize the human impacts of an earthquake on one page um, with the understanding that so just knowing the magnitude um, is really not enough information to determine what the impact of an earthquake is on human populations. Um, so we came up with a an alert scale, um, so green, and I think I 
Yeah, so I cover this on the next slide. So we have an alert scale that talks about the, the sort of relative level of, of impact of this earthquake, and then the table of population exposure to shaking, um, a map of uh, contours of shaking intensity over population, and then uh, various information about uh, impacts uh, on nearby cities, and then uh, other similar earthquakes in the past and the impacts that they had. So pager alerts, uh, like I said, are an effort to estimate impacts of earthquakes on, on people. So there's fatalities and then dollar losses. Um, so those losses are calculated from population exposure to shaking. Um, so earthquakes near large population centers cause more damages, injuries, and fatalities. Um, and, and when I talk about last week's earthquakes, I'll go into that a little bit more. And so these, this is just a, a table sort of showing the scale. Um, and so we have this kind of a nice parallel between the, the fatality scale and the, the economic loss scale. So a green alert for fatalities is that we, our model estimates zero fatalities uh, or less than a million dollars in loss. Yellow is one to 100 fatalities or one to 100 million dollars in loss. Orange is 100 to 1,000 fatalities or 100 million to 1 billion dollars in US losses. Red is uh, 1,000 plus fatalities or 1 billion dollars or more in damage. Um, so it turns out that when you make this scale, um, so we calculate a number. Um, we don't generally sort of uh, present that number because it's not actually all that useful um, because it's almost certainly, as an exact number, wrong in terms of its, its estimate of the losses. Um, but the, the range that it falls in is actually pretty accurate and, and pretty useful. And it turns out that, generally speaking, um, the response uh, level that, that is sort of generated for each of these um, uh, alert levels that we have are pretty much the same. So if you have 536 fatalities that you modeled or 237 fatalities, the level of response is about the same. The same number of trucks and fire uh, fighters and cops and all that kind of stuff that you're going to send out is going to be roughly the same. And if you have, in a developing country in particular, an earthquake with more than 1,000 fatalities, it doesn't really matter. You're pulling out all the stops. You're going to send all of your response people in. You're going to muster all your resources and, and pile them in there. So it's been a pretty useful um, thing. And our customers for this are people like uh, Federal Emergency Management Agency uh, inside the US, and then um, the Office of Foreign Disaster Assistance um, for Global Response, the military who also does disaster response. Um, so they use this information basically to tell them, you know, so the, the, the intent is, you know, if you're an analyst with, with FEMA or OFTA or something, and you get an alert on your phone in the middle of the night, uh, and you see that it's a green alert, you can probably go back to bed. If it's yellow in the country of interest, you might want to wake up and start making some phone calls and, and check stuff on the ground. If it's red, you should probably get dressed and go into the office and start figuring out what to do. Um, and then, and, and because these are models, this is not actually ground collected information, right? So the, the um, goal is that this is sort of to kick off the process of response and um, get things started. OK, so uh, the comprehensive catalog, so ComCat. Um, so like I said before, most earthquake catalogs just sort of contain time, location, and magnitude. Um, and so we aggregate in that information from multiple sources, including our own catalog. Uh, and then it also sort of piles in uh, data products from ShakeMap, Pager, DigiFeelIt, and a whole bunch of other sort of more technical, uh, detailed uh, systems that we have. And so that system has a web, AP, a web API uh, that was developed by our, our web team. Um, so I'm going to do a demo of, of the Python wrapper around that, but I wanted to um, just sort of stop and talk about the earthquakes from last week. Um, so on July 4th, uh, so last Thursday at about 10.30 in the morning local time, uh, we had a magnitude 6.4 earthquake. Uh, and so according to the pager models, uh, about 2,000 people were exposed to uh, severe shaking, so intensity eight. Um, and as, as far as we know uh, from looking at the news, we had minor injuries and no fatalities. Um, so and I just want to say that if, if you're looking for information about an earthquake, um, it is valuable to come to our website and look at how these models work and look at magnitude and look at the, the estimated impact. But it's also really important to go look at the news um, because we don't we don't have people on the ground out there sort of reporting on what, are, what actually happened. We're just estimating this to quickly give some idea to people who need to respond about 
you know, how much, how quickly they should, they should uh, get on the phone and start, and start making phone calls. Um, so then a day later, on July 5th, uh, there was magnitude 7.1 uh, in pretty close to the same area. Um, and so uh, 45,000 people were exposed to very strong shaking intensity 7, so that's one um, level down, um, but a larger number of people exposed to that uh, thing. And again, minor injuries, uh, no fatalities. Um, and then the cumulative damage from both earthquakes. Um, so and I, I went to the news for this, and so this is one place where journalism does, does the job that it's supposed to do, right? Um, so there were toppled chin chimneys, um, buildings damaged or destroyed, roads cracked, uh, gas leaks, fires, um, a, a lot of panic and confusion. Um, uh, my sister texted me from Southern California. <laughs> um, and so it turns out location matters, right? So this is a, the map that we make for Pager, which is basically just showing the contour of intensity uh, over a population, a grayscale population map, right? So the darker colors are higher density populations and the light colors are low density populations. So these earthquakes both happened out in uh, the desert, uh, not near a, a large population, which was really good news because if it had happened, say here in Los Angeles, which is a city of 13 million people, um, it would have been much, much worse. Um, both of them would have been much, much worse. Um, and so this, again, this, this knowledge of location and ground shaking intensity uh, is one of the reasons why knowing only earthquake magnitude is really not that useful because it doesn't tell you information like this, like, oh, where, where is it? Uh, how deep is it? All that kind of stuff. Um, okay, so I'm going to embark on a live demo which, that's crazy, don't do a live demo. Um, okay, so let me expand this. Um, so yeah, so libcomcat is a library that I wrote. Um, it has some dependencies which you can install with Conda. Um, so some cautions for the data science type folks out there. Um, one, please don't use this as denial uh, of service attack tool against our website. Um, we have enough accidental of that. Uh, and then um, also be cautious about using this data and then drawing conclusions without any sort of domain knowledge about earthquakes or seismology or geophysics. Um, I get a fair number of questions from uh, data science students who just want to use this because it's a big data set and they just want to play with it. And I'm, I get a little concerned about people, say, drawing conclusions between magnitude and fatalities, which is a terrible correlation. Um, so don't try that, by the way. Um, Anyway, okay, so cautions aside, let's plunge ahead. So we'll import um, some basic stuff from the standard library. Oh, I thought I, okay. And what happened to my browser? Okay, there we go. Uh, and this probably needs to be bigger. Does that work for everybody? Okay, all right, so. Uh, so import uh, standard stuff from Python, um, and then the stuff that, that we wrote uh, is in here, and then some third-party imports for uh, mapping things in matplotlib and numpy and pandas and whatnot. Uh, define some constants. Um, so, okay, so let's uh, download um, large events, so magnitude 7.5 to 9.9 .9, uh, from 1900 until now. Um, so we can do that. And so hopefully the internet is behaving. Um, and I had a backup just in case the internet was not behaving. So there are 460 uh, events in that range since 1900. Um, so generally speaking, uh, you get roughly an order of magnitude more earthquakes um, in the same period of time when you go up a level. So there are roughly, I think, uh, order of magnitude more fives than fours, and an order of magnitude more uh, sixes than fives, and so on and so forth. Um, okay, so let's see. Uh, so let's just make a map of this. Okay, thank you. Um, really quickly, using Cartopy, and so uh, you can just sort of plot locations of the big earthquakes um, since 1900, um, really quickly using Cartopy, which is a great package for anybody who's not already using it. Um, and so then let's go ahead and get the last two years of significant pager uh, alerts, so all the, the yellows, oranges, and reds. 
Um, so I'll fetch that data, which is gonna take a little bit. Hopefully not too long. Awkward silence. Come on. I know. <laughs> um, all right, let's kill that. Uh, is it still running? Yeah, okay, so I have online or local backup. Um, so yeah, so we have in the last two years, uh, 35 yellow alerts, uh, five orange alerts and five red alerts. So uh, by the way, so these are the summary alerts. So basically we take the, the higher of the two, either fatality or economic loss alert. Uh, values, and then we call that the sort of summary alert. Um, so again, let's make a map across the world. Um, and so there we go. So we have um, all those events plotted, and so you can sort of see uh, the the ring of fire. It's easier on this guy. Um, you know, the earthquakes happen along these subduction zones. Um, as you go around, I'll use this. Um, so deduction zones that are up here, and then starting from Mexico and going down into Chile, and then along down through Japan and the Philippines and out through Indonesia and Sumatra. Um, so that's basically it, except um, let's do go back to this. Um, Uh, and I'll just show my links and then uh, take questions. Thanks. Thanks, Mike. We have plenty of time for questions. Thanks. First of all, excellent talk. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, great distillation of seismology. <laughs> it seems like a natural extension of what you've done here would be to interface to tsunami prediction and possibly into volcanogenic prediction. Are there any plans in the works for that? Uh, yeah, so um, this is w one of the annoying answers that nobody likes to hear from the government. Um, <laughs> but tsunamis are not our job. Tsunamis are NOAA's job. Um, so we do interface with them. We have uh, their tsunami alerts on our web page, so when they detect, um, they put out tsunami alerts on their website and then they send us a message that we then put on our website that indicates that there is um, potentially a tsunami. Um, and then it's basically just a link back to their website with information about, um, you know, potential uh, sea level or, you know, potential waves that might hit certain locations and so they have wave heights at various locations from their models. Um, so that's, I mean, and that is a whole other effort. I mean, tsunami pr prediction is, is a very big um, project on its own, and so that's that's Noah's job. Uh, uh, thank you. I think this is very meaningful. Uh, so I'm wondering, like, uh, if you after you did a, a near real time estimation on the the earth earthquake that is happening, like the one on July 4th, uh, do you go to uh, like California for the uh, a field investigation to validate your prediction? Uh, I don't, but our scientists do, yeah. So I think, um, so I missed most of the sort of excitement about this um, because it happened Thursday and Friday and I left on Sunday. And so I, I'm hearing that this week has been uh, quite the flurry of activity in our office. And so yeah, generally speaking, after big earthquakes, we do send field teams to go check out damage. So we have uh, structural engineers who go look at and inspect damage and try to get some sense of, of what actually happened on the ground. Um, we have, uh, uh, scientists who go out and look at, at things like ground failure, so liquefaction and landslides, and we have a whole project that, which I didn't even talk about, that a uh, model that calculates um, probabilities of landslides and liquefaction based on shaking, uh, ground shaking, and so they'll go out and they'll do ground truth for that and then, and then try and map instances of, of landslides and liquefaction. So yeah, we do do that. Um, so first of all, excellent talk. I really enjoyed it. Um, so you mentioned the value of going to news websites to get a better idea of what's actually going on mm -hmm. after um, you see an earthquake report. So are there any plans to have something like semantic analysis performed on news headlines that appear immediately after an earthquake starts? Um, there are people who have done that. Um, 
And so the problem, so we do go back in time. And so the, the pager model was developed by looking at um, reports from past earthquakes about losses and fatalities and buildings damage and injuries and all kinds of stuff. Um, and so we go back and we look at those final reports. And most of the sort of final numbers come from like government reports where they actually survey all this stuff. Um, yeah, so trusting, trusting news sites is one thing, um, but it's easy, really easy to get those numbers wrong um, early on. And, uh, and so if you get, and if you look at say CNN and NBC.com and they have different numbers, then which one do you trust? Um, but there is a project to try to uh, update our uh, loss model in near real time using information that's coming in. It would be probably manual, so we would have a human looking at reports and saying, okay, so we have multiple people reporting 10 fatalities. So the idea being, you know, our model predicts zero fatalities, but we actually have reports of five fatalities. And so, we, okay, we know that the model isn't actually correct, so let's update our prior, right? And, and recalculate a new model with at least knowing that we have five fatalities. So that's, that's undergoing, uh, ongoing right now. Um, as far as actually scraping websites, um, probably not right now, um, but it's something we can try and do in the future. Just a quick follow up, Mike. Have you looked at uh, mining Twitter? Because the Twitter API is extraordinarily good. Uh, yeah, so the problem with accuracy, again, of accuracy on data on Twitter is also, I mean, even more of a problem than it is for sort of regular news sites. Um, and so just looking at pictures, so, so scientists who know what they're doing can look at pictures of building damage and actually estimate a, a Mercalli intensity from that. The problem is, and I've seen this, um, people will post pictures of damaged buildings from an earthquake that happened in the past. So the, we had some recent earthquakes in Mexico and people posted damage from earthquakes in the 1985 Mexican earthquake. And it's really hard to automatically pick up the difference for that. It's sometimes hard to pick up the difference from that if you're manually scrolling through the feed. So, yeah, we can, and we, and we actually have a whole other project using Twitter to, to um, use people as human detectors and, and feed that in. And so that's a whole other talk that somebody else could give. Uh, hi, uh, I come from a place that earthquakes are pretty common, so I don't even blink an eye of <laughs> anything that's smaller than six. Uh -huh. And I only start to worry when there's something sm larger than seven. Uh, but like since about like three years ago, we had like a 7.8 uh, that had like more than 700 fatalities and mm -hmm. stuff like that. And so since then, I have a, a notification service in Telegram that feeds from USGS mm -hmm. and or local um, thing. But uh, I'm kind of concerned about the pros and cons about communicating information to people because what I have noticed from that is that people create a lot of apocalyptic predictions for earthquakes that are like two or right. three mm -hmm. or four and like think that the earth is going to end because of that. So right. what's, what, what's your feeling about the effect of providing information to people at that level? I mean, uh, uh, basically we do the best we can. Um, I mean, and, and the whole intent behind Pager was to, to try to estimate impact, right? Not just report um, magnitudes, which is what we did for years. Um, and so, we, we, you know, we are the responsible agency telling the rest of the United States government, you know, there has been an earthquake in Indonesia or Iran or Sumatra or something. And, you know, and we used to just say this is the magnitude and that's all we knew. Um, so I think the best thing we can do is provide as much information as we can um, about modeled impacts and then caution people to, you know, go check uh, local news sources. I mean, that's what we tell our direct customers, people like FEMA and, and the Office of Foreign Disaster Assistance go check your ground sources and find out how serious this really is. I mean, if for no other reason, um, you know, if you're gonna send planes to fly into Nepal or something after an earthquake, you probably better figure out whether the airport's even <laughs> up and running, right, before you send a plane to land there. So, I mean, there's, we're just the sort of kickoff point for getting more information um, from the ground. Yeah, I mean, so we can't, we can't really control what the internet does with the information we provide, so. Two more quick questions. Okay. Um, you had mentioned a need for uh, domain expertise before mm -hmm. using this data set. Right. And I was wondering if you think that there's a knowledge gap in data science uh, with data scientists, especially pertaining to geospatial and location data and how to fill that gap. Um, so I guess it's, it's, so my concern, the geospatial um, information gap is not the one I'm concerned about in this particular case. It's the sort of geophysics and epidemiology and understanding of, so I mean, our model is, our loss model is based on um, 
population exposure to shaking because it's the shaking that actually causes damage. And if you're in a building, you know, that building can collapse and, and fall down on people. Um, so that's the kind of thing I'm concerned about. Um, more generally speaking, my concern with data science, is, data science is that I feel like a lot of people, so data science is the intersection between what software, statistics, and domain knowledge. And I feel like that domain knowledge gets sort of brushed aside by a lot of people. Um, so I guess my, generally speaking, my feeling is that the data scientists um, just need to be really careful about that domain knowledge, whatever it might be, um, whether it's, you know, crime statistics or, or earthquakes or weather or anything, right? It's just to be aware of that kind of thing. Um, I mean, the geospatial part, I think, is, you know, potentially also a problem, but it's, it's, it's pretty easy and not that um, dangerous, I don't think, to sort of put things on a map. Um, it might be dangerous to start drawing correlations about clustering of, of earthquakes together um, if you don't know why they're happening in that location, right, which goes back to the geophysics part of it. So hopefully that answered your question. I'm originally from San Diego, and okay. I lived in Southern California up until college where I moved to Philly, and we only had one earthquake in the last 10 years. Uh, but I'm a night owl, and so occasionally I would be up at 1, 2 in the morning, and I would feel a minor earthquake, and immediately my mom and I would be like, oh, okay, cool, go on the USGS put in the info, like, let's check the map. And it was really, really fun. So this is super cool. Um, but I'm wondering it's to just see like, okay, there have been 10 responses in our zip code. You know, right. there have been five responses. So I'm wondering, uh, does the timing of earthquakes impact the accuracy of your models and the results that you're able to get? Because uh, similar to her question, not many people are going to feel a 2.0 or 3.0 earthquake at 2 in the morning. They're going to sleep through it. Um, so... So, uh, yeah, so we don't detect every earthquake um, uh, around the world. So our threshold, I think, globally is something like four and a half. Um, and so we'll, we'll locate those. Inside the U.S., it's much lower. And there are other regional networks that, de that uh, detect the smaller ones. So California will go all the way down to magnitude 0 0.1. Um, and so their, I mean, the, their systems will detect those earthquakes. Whether or not we get digi-field responses is dependent on yeah, how many people are in that area, um, how many people are awake, or how many people were woken up. Uh, I, I grew up in Southern California as well. I tended to sleep through a lot of earthquakes. Um, so yeah, it just depends. And, and, and then in countries that aren't, are not you know, well connected to the internet, I get, internet, we get fewer did you feel it responses. But I mean, generally speaking, did you feel it as one of the systems that you hear about and you think that shouldn't work? That's crazy. <laughs> Like, why would, you, why would you be able to sort of have people give their responses? People would lie all the time, and it, and it shouldn't work, but it does. Um, so it's, it's kind of amazing, yeah. All right, two very quick announcements before we thank uh, Mike again. One o'clock here, Pangeo Boff. 2.35 back here for the second round of talks right after the tools session. Thank you to Mike and all the speakers in our session and to you, the audience, for being great. <laughs> <laughs>